I've okay, never talked about this before. This is fun. <laughs> It is fun. I'm really, 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 really happy to be here outside in fresh sunshine to be talking to one of my favorite people. You know, when you just have those people that you see them and you like glow inside and you just want to give them a really big hug. <laughs> well, world, please meet Ted. Oh. Ted Moskowitz is here, amongst other things. Uh, he is a tech investor and uh, I met him through a consultancy working in the blockchain space. And uh, most recently, he's started a company called Alma Healing, which deals with uh, really, I would say, providing ethics around the burgeoning cannabis industry and uh, definitely have some of their own high quality CBD oil and other products. And so we're going to be exploring the worlds of uh, historical ethnobotany as well as whatever might come on, on the tech investing side. I want to hear definitely all the updates from Alma Healing and Ted to top it off is a new father. So what a time <laughs> to be a new father as well. Um, so I'm very, very, very happy to have you here, Ted. Do you want to speak a little bit to the audience about your background? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's like the most beautiful intro I think I've ever gotten. Um, so yeah, you know, my background is in a bunch of different things, um, international development, politics, things like that. You know, I've done work with like Bono and the One Campaign, Wyclef Jean Yale Haiti, Michelle Obama Healthy Kids, Ken Burns the Filmmaker, um, and really, you know, I've had an interest for a long time in, in like development, right? Um, but I essentially realized like early in my career that at the root of a lot of these development problems and human rights problems was economics, right? Um, and so I decided if I was going to really help and do, you know, interesting human rights work, I had to sort of learn like the sort of economic fundamentals of these things. Um, so went to law school, studied business, became a securities lawyer at the SEC. So you can see the pendulum kind of swung really far, you know, in one direction. Um, and I really liked it. And it was cool to be on the cutting edge of all things tech and working with IPOs and things. But, you know, what I realized was more than being in the like sort of seat of a regulator, I want to be a creator um, and someone who is building things. Um, and I'd way rather be on the other side and letting people tell me what not to do than being the one, you know, trying to tell people what not to do, right? So um, I left the law, you know, took this huge leap from, you know, stable, safe career, um, started a startup and was one of the lucky few who actually was able to build something from it. Um, so started a software company with one of my friends, built that up, um, was able to spin off part of it. Um, and then just started, like, really, once I kind of knew what I was doing in an entrepreneur, um, started doing more advisory work for other people's companies, um, taking small equity stakes in friends' companies and just helping them grow and scale and things like that. Um, and always with this sort of framework of transformative technology and social impact and just asking this question of like, who is building the tech that I think is going to radically shape our future um, and shape the future of humanity in a positive way? And so that's really been, you know, my mission for a long time. Um, and, you know, so because of that, like, as an investor, advisor, founder, you know, I've had this sort of front row seat to, you know, all the claims of what tech is most going to transform humanity, right? Um, but what I've realized in the past, like, year and a half, two years is that the only tech that I think actually matters is this. It's the human OS, right? It's, it's the operating system that runs our own minds. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, when I first started getting into um, this sort of hemp space, you know, I'd had a lot of sort of negative experiences trying CBD and cannabis products, never really felt anything from it, you know, didn't really have any effects. But about a couple of years ago, um, like got keyed into something that at least when I tried it for the first time was like, wow, this is real plant medicine. Like there's something here. Um, and really what was so unique about it is it drops you into your parasympathetic nervous system, right? So it gets you out of that fight or flight mode. It allows you to be calm and centered, you know, and grounded. I think that's the place from which like so much creativity springs forth and so much of like the best things that we make springs forth. Um, and so, you know, kind of went from being a tech investor to now like someone slinging plants, right? Um, but really I think it's because like these plants are the technology, you know, is what I'm realizing. And, you know, it's our job to extract them responsibly, not mess them up too much, leave them as close to a natural state as possible. But yeah, it, it is real tech, right? And so, you know, people ask what I do and I'm still like a tech investor and advisor. It's just now I think some of these natural plants are, are amazing technology and I want to bring them to the world. And, and I think it's something that's going to shape it up positively going forward. I love it. <laughs> I'm sure everyone listening and watching can understand the, the overlay of yeah. our paths and uh, desires in the world. 
Um, so I want to, before we forget, dive in because I was sent this box, My Alma Healing, a few weeks ago and I've, I've yet to dive into it. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful display of, of the samples here. And Ted was very much with the Burning Man principle of immediacy and said, well, why don't we just try it now? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And I ran and I got everything needed to try this Elevate product. So I'm guessing that um, it takes some time to witness the effects, which we'll talk about what it is because I'm sure many people listening are like, wait, Andy's taking drugs, what? But it's not. <laughs> And um, so first, I think best is maybe tell me how to take it. We'll take it together. And yes. then as with anything else, I'm a scientist in this living laboratory of a body. And so I'll, I'll report every few 10 minute segments how, how I'm feeling and what I observe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so you're going to do two full droppers into a beverage. So I've got my like nice, you know, label bottle here. Um, okay. So you do two full droppers um, in there. Like 100 100 milliliters? Yeah, however much you want. I mean, it has like a strong hempy flavor. And so we have a whole recipe vibe that goes with it of pairing it with things that are interesting. But as someone like myself who, you know, likes matcha and would probably just drink like cold press, you know, hemp juice by itself, like, I don't think it's going to bother you too much. Um, so I'd say, yeah, a couple full droppers. Um, one dropper. All right. Yeah. And am I drinking it all at once? I would say just sip on it. So one of the things that's really interesting about this product is the immediacy. Um, you know, it, it's a nano emulsion, and so it's going to absorb sublingually under your tongue and esophageally as you're swallowing it. And I'll say friends of mine who are what we'll call like plant sensitive or substance sensitive, within two or three minutes, they start to notice the effects of it. Um, and it's really designed as something that is presencing, right? So part of what we'll be talking about is the shift away from alcohol, right? Um, and alternative beverages for connecting with people. And there's this great irony, you know, with alcohol consumption, which is like, when we're going out to a bar, you know, is the booze really the product or is it the high vibe environment? Is it the opportunity to connect with people, right? Like, I think it's the latter. Well, how ironic is it that alcohol is such a barrier to presence and to connection, right? And so what we want to do is create a nightlife beverage that really lets you get present with people, lets you get connected with people, that gets rid of your social anxiety, that has you feeling loose and sociable and, and all of these things. Um, but without the negative effects of booze, right? So we'll, we'll circle back around to that. Um, you know, I think as a part of the discussion of like where we're going with, you know, conscious consumption and nightlife beverages, we have to sort of look back and say like, where did we come from, right? And how did alcohol become such a prominent part of society and what's its anthropological role, right? And why did it have this place of primacy before we can talk about how do we begin to decouple like celebration from alcohol and having fun from alcohol and going out at night and having a drink from alcohol, right? So that's what I'm excited to, to dive into with you, yeah. I love it. Can you tell the audience specifically what is in this little bottle that I'm ingesting? Yeah, okay, so it is a ultrasonically produced micro, micro encapsulated liposomal nano emulsion <laughs> of cold Which press. means? Yeah, so basically, um, what we do is we try and keep the plant, the hemp plant, like in as close to a natural state as possible. Um, we minimally process it. We don't use any additional solvents. We don't use any heat because, and this is part of what I discovered, you know, when I sort of had this transition from being like, you know, CBD hemp skeptic toward like a believer um, was essentially realizing that the reason most of it doesn't have an effect is the way that it's manufactured and it's processed, right? So typically what happens is we extract it using these chemical solvents, we use a lot of heat in the process as we're doing it. And we're degrading all these beneficial compounds that are found in the plant that are really delicate and really volatile. And so even if you hear like full spectrum, broad spectrum, you know, these terms thrown around that are supposed to mean it has like, you know, everything from the plant in it. Even if you test it after the fact, it shows you, oh, it has all these beneficial compounds, but you don't realize it's been degraded to a point where your body can't actually utilize it. Um, so what we do is no heat, no additional solvent. It's essentially the cold pressed juice of hemp. Um, and so we're retaining all those natural benefits. So this product is essentially just that, right? It's like cold pressed hemp juice essentially um, that we've extracted. And then we use an ultrasound machine to break it into a nanoparticle. So a really tiny particle size that it can absorb under your tongue and in your esophagus, as opposed to having to pass through your liver and small intestine, which is how like most hemp extracts work. And that takes like an hour and a half to two hours whereas ours goes to work, you know, pretty much right away. So, um, so it's designed as a beverage additive. I see you're having it straight in water, which is really aggressive because it's a very strong, hempy flavor. 
Um, it's more designed to be like mixed with other things. And we have like whole recipe guides and stuff around, you know, the flavor profiles that go well with it. Um, but that's essentially what it is, just like cold pressed hemp juice turned into a nanoparticle. Okay, so let's get uh, botanical. Yeah. First of all, um, I have a few questions about oxidation with the nanoparticle formation process, but even before we get there, we'll walk everyone through step by step. When you say hemp, you're talking about seed, flower, leaf, root, what part of the plant? Yeah, so typically like CBD products are made from biomass, which is sort of like what's left over after you pull the buds off. Um, so we actually use like the aerial parts of the plant, so like real flowers. So it's the actual buds, um, but it doesn't have THC. So there's, you know, there's sort of discussion of like cannabis and marijuana versus THC or versus hemp. And a lot of people think it's different plants. That's not actually the case. So it really has to do with whether there's an enzyme present that's converting cannabinoids into THC versus into CBD and other cannabinoids. So it's essentially the same plant. We're just using the version that produces CBD and all these other beneficial compounds instead. Um, but it's the hemp plant that's grown in Colorado, 5,000 foot elevation, um, which decreases the need for pesticides because there's less natural pests. Um, there's a lot of UV at that elevation. So the plant produces more of this resinous material and the resinous material is where like all the goodies are actually found in the plant. Um, and yeah, that, that's the gist of it. Okay, so if I get back to you and say it's using aerial parts of the plant, so all above ground plants, including the bud, or just not including, including the bud? Including the bud, yeah. Including the bud. So Ama Healing stuff is all aerial parts of the plant that have been, uh, let's say, processed or grown as well at high altitude. So they are, by definition, organic. Welcome to being outside, everyone. <laughs> Beautiful background noise. And uh, then the cold press process, that's what I want to get into next, with the nanoparticleization, which is now a word. Uh, what, with that extraction, does oxidation affect it? How, how does that work? Yeah, so like you're essentially, you're using a closed loop for, you know, there's basically like seven parts of the extraction process. And we can decide how deep we want to go into the science behind it, but you know, we'll just sort of leave it at like, there's essentially a closed loop for six of the seven parts of it, um, all the way up until we get to this ultrasonification process. And so when you're not introducing oxygen into the environment, um, you know, you're not going to have the issues with oxidation that are like really often problems with this stuff. Um, and then on the ultrasonification step, what we do to prevent oxidation and some of the breakdown is we use Quilaja extract, which is called soap bark. Um, as an emulsifier. So it's a national emulsifier that is unlike a lot of other surfactants, which are things that you add to these oils to like keep them in suspension. So it's this essentially a natural surfactant that allows us to keep it in suspension. Um, and when you have the micro encapsulation of it, there's essentially like a lipid bubble around the product. And that's going to prevent a lot of the oxidation from taking place. There's a lot that goes into this, you know, but uh, that's, that's essentially the gist of it, right? Is you're creating like these little bubbles bubble. with the good, yeah, <laughs> lipid bubble with the good stuff in the middle, right? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, cool. So um, let's let's dive a little bit more into cannabis. I want to make an announcement that I've made a few, quite a few times now um, since last year, actually in Austin at Future Frontiers when I was on a panel about cannabis. That uh, I am, whereas two years ago I I started getting well, actually more four or five years ago started getting drawn into the psychedelic renaissance and bringing people back to plant medicine. Um, for the future of humanity. And originally, I mean, I did my master's of science in ethnobotany because I wanted to study plant medicine. And of course, the year before me at the University of Kent, uh, a guy had gone to the Andes to study plant medicine and hadn't come back. And so they were quite dissuading of anyone studying <laughs> plant medicine. So that didn't happen during my master's career. But it was after that that I started becoming involved with Sendo and MAPS and uh, then last year, a little more than a year ago, I was hiking in uh, Brazil in a gorgeous national park called Chapada Diamantina, which I highly recommend everyone put high up on your bucket list. And uh, I had a series of mushroom trips back to back that um, one of the big messages that came through was, Andy, you need to, like, you need to do what you can to help in the psychedelic renaissance. And even though I've been actively involved in that, obviously putting on conferences at Burning Man about it, et cetera, et cetera, um, cannabis is, is just this one that kind of is always something that definitely triggers me. I have my own personal stigma against it since I have a brother who has spent, uh, more than half of his life now 
immersed in the plant and uh, I feel that that has stifled a lot of his genius that he could share to the world. Um, and it is a plant specifically when it's used for its flowering parts and often smoked that creates a state of being that whereas it might um, indoctrinate creativity for a lot of people, it doesn't necessarily um, create much action in the world. And the kind of person that I'm specifically born here to be is one that is action oriented and doing the bigger things in the world. So um, whereas I have this personal stigma towards cannabis, of course, uh, the up and coming cannabis industry and the bubble, if, if you will, is something that's garnering a lot of attention from different parts of the world. And um, you guys were quite early on, more than a year ago, in, in establishing AMA and saying, okay, there's a lot of bullshit being thrown around. We need someone who's doing something real and right. Um, so if we could take steps back to towards cannabis and looking at cannabis as a plant, looking at um, obviously cannabinoids and CBD as opposed to THC, and just like that general, for anyone who's kind of entering the conversation from the beginning point, what's your take on that, Ted? Yeah, so I'll say like, I've personally experienced a lot of the sort of downsides of the plant that you're talking about. For me, those typically come out when I'm dealing with cannabis that has THC in it, right? So a lot of the brain fog and like you said, you know, bias against action, like I'll just call it laziness, right? Which has been a huge issue for me, right? And I think like that's real, you know, especially in high THC um, containing plants and like extracts and things like that. I've seen that, you know, in myself at times and other people in my lives and things like that. And, and that's totally real, right? Like you have this balance between the creativity and then also like the bias against action I think you can get from it. And I'll say at least my personal experience and those of a lot of like our customers and friends in the space is that the non THC containing plants, um, or when you at least remove the THC from it, tend to not have those issues as much. Um, so everyone can kind of decide for themselves, you know, what that is. Um, but at least that's been the experience for me. Um, and, you know, something I'll mention is like all of our products contain 0.0% .0 THC. Um, so by law, you're allowed to have up to 0.3%, but we actually remove it completely um, in this unique way. Um, and part of the reason is that we don't want to have any of that psychoactive effect or some of those downsides that come from it. But we also want to be accessible to everyone, whether you're doctor, military, law enforcement, you know, teacher, people who get drug tested who can't have, you know, like this in their system, we want to be accessible to them. Um, and also the sober community and the recovery community, which is a really big audience, especially for Elevate, this product in general, um, that they're actually using and enjoying a lot. So, you know, we kind of have to draw that line of like, you know, where does, I guess, it fall on that spectrum of like substance versus not, right? Um, but I think this tends to be one that, you know, strays more on the side of like not having as many of those effects but yeah so anyways stepping back right like cannabis is a plant that's been used you know for thousands of years right and it pops up in so many societies independently like you know we see it in china and in india and south america and the middle east i mean you know it really is is one of these really important you know teacher plants right um you know you use the term plant medicine which is interesting my friends Tom cole i guess about a month ago i saw them speak and and they're talking about how we need to stop saying plant medicine because that implies that there's something wrong with you and that you need medication and that's not the case. So instead they call them plant teachers, which is something that I think is really beautiful and, and I've been sort of trending towards. So, you know, cannabis has been one of these plant teachers for a long time. Um, and depending on where it's grown, the conditions and things, you know, it has a lot of different effects. Like some of it is more uplifting, some of it is more relaxing, you know, some of it is better for certain ailments than others. And a lot of that, that comes down to what are the chemicals that are present in it or whether right so thc is the one that gets you high so we sort of think of that one first right but th is one of hundreds literally hundreds of beneficial and therapeutic compounds that are found in this plant right cbd is another one that gets talked about a lot right now and it's sort of this craze right um but when you look at why that's the case like i don't think cbd alone is actually that interesting the reason cbd is so popular is that it's present in the highest quantity in the plant and it's the cheapest to commercially extract from the plant so of course, right, like that's the industry that's popped up around it, right? So, you know, I don't like to talk about us as being a CBD company because it's one of over a hundred beneficial compounds that are in there, right? So there's CBN, there's CBG, there's CBC, there's all these other cannabinoids. And then we can get into flavonoids and then we can get into terpenes, which are like the smell molecules of the world, right? So you have like lanolin. So lanolin is what gives lavender, it's a lavenderiness, right? Um, or linalool, sorry, there's like limonene, 
limonene is what gives citrus fruit its citrusiness, right? And it's found in the peels of citrus fruits and things like that. So, you know, like when you smell citrus, it's uplifting. When you smell lavender, it's relaxing. The same thing is happening when you're taking those compounds through the plant. You're having that same sort of effect in your body, right? So depending on what effect you want to have, you want to make sure you're using a product that has, you know, the sort of profile um, that's going to match that. So there's a lot of different ways that these plants are used. But, you know, one thing that I think is, is pretty common throughout is like they have had a role, right, um, historically for a really long time. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for getting into the secondary chemical metabolites. Our students at, uh, at TIFA, at the Institute for Aliveness, had a whole herbal week where we went into a lot of the botany and a lot of the, really, it's ethnopharmacology to look I at. Forget, I can go really deep with your audience here. Okay, I'll have to like research, because normally all the eyes glaze over when I start talking about this. I'll have good, to recalibrate a little audience. bit now that, uh, to know that we can put it on it, yeah. If we want to do a follow-up for the TIFA students and they can ask all the technical questions, we can. But um, I, love, I love that emphasis, the re-emphasis on the fact that um, to extract one part of a plant and to assume that that is the only, um, I want to say, medicine giving property but stepping away from medicine uh, because really what we do at TIFA is we're applied epigeneticists so it's lifestyle medicine you know this water is medicine and yeah. so it's it's a little bit reconceptualizing um, the the idea and the, the wording of what medicine is um, but nonetheless uh, so Elevate then you're saying contains uh, tons of secondary chemical compounds, these metabolites, far beyond CBD. And so you're using the whole host of effects of the plants to get an elevated state, I might guess. Yeah. So, you know, the thing that's interesting about it is people say like, you know, what does it make me feel like? What's it going to do to me? And I think, you know, we have this framework, right? When taking substance that it's going to do something to you, right? Um, and I think in the health and wellness space in general, like this is the framework that we see, right? You are broken, take this, it will fix you, right? And that's a very like masculine dominant way of thinking about things. Whereas like cannabis is a feminine plant, right? Which is a lot more nurturing, a lot more allowing. Um, like ama, the name itself um, in both Sanskrit and some, in some Latin cultures, like means mother, is like an honorific for mother, right? And so part of what we're trying to say with this is we're not adding something, we're stripping away. So we're removing anxiety, we're removing aches and pains, right? So we're not like having a feeling imposed on us, but we're allowing ourselves to have like our innate wellness shine through, right? And so we can get into this parasympathetic nervous system and sort of get out of that fight or flight mode. Like that calm grounded feeling, like that's an addictive feeling, right? Like you tell you about substance being addictive, like being in your best self, like that feels really good, right? So that's the feeling that I think is essentially coming through is one where you feel really grounded, where you feel connected, you know, to the people who you're with, you feel an absence of like the aches and pains that you experience, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and you feel loose and sociable because you don't have your social anxiety, you know, and like that extra sort of voice running in your mind, right? Um, and so that negative self-talk script running. So I think that's sort of the easiest way to describe it as like the absence of all the things that prevent you from like being your best self and having your innate wellness shine through. So give me an idea of the actual um, dosage in comparison to like a traditionally extracted essential oil. Um, just in terms of like when I, when I look at this, I'm taking in plant chemicals and um, uh, we have a few different governing ideas at, at the Institute for Aliveness. Um, one being in general, taking anything in from outside is inherently disempowering because at the end of the day, if we can be with ourselves and take a placebo of, I'm going to drink my anxiety remover, whatever yeah. it is, and then show up as if I was drunk. Like that's more of the approach that we take. Yeah. And nonetheless, the medicinal effects of, of plants and plant life uh, are undeniable. And in the herb curriculum that we have at the Institute for Aliveness, uh, we really look and feature teas because of the, the more natural dosage, if you will. Yeah. A lot of the pharmaceutical industry um, first completely saturated and then synthesized these plant chemicals. And, um, you know, that's what creates medications that fuck you up in way more ways than they help you. Yeah. And so, 
Yeah. In terms of this, like we like to visualize, okay, when I have this one drop of lemon essential oil that I'm putting in my water, that's the equivalent of having pretty much 10 lemons yeah. and with all the water evaporated. So what would be like a more or less equivalency if we're looking at the cannabis plant? Yeah. So I think one, like I have to just appreciate something you said, which is that like we don't need these external substances to reach these states, right? Like all states that are available through whatever substance are available innately without them, right? It's more like sometimes we just need a little bit of help, right? Like our world is a crazy one. And there's a lot of external stresses and there's a lot of negative inputs. And so, you know, unfortunately we're not in a position where we can always just through like our daily rituals and meditation, like drop into these places. We're just trying to help a little bit, right? And help you sort of like feel that place and then be like, oh, right, this is what it feels like. And then through your yoga and meditation practice and whatever your sort of rituals are, like be able to access those on your own, right? So I think that's a really important point. Um, so in terms of the dosage, so like one dose of this is about 18 milligrams of phytocannabinoids. Um, and there's different concentrations of different ones in there, right? So, you know, some of them exist only in like parts per million, right? Which is still enough. Like if it's binding to the receptor, if it's 30 parts per million, it doesn't matter. Like that's going to be enough to have the effect, right? Um, if you were to like, you know, smoke a full joint or something, which I guess is sort of like the equivalent that we think of, you know, when, when dealing with cannabis, um, I mean, you're going to be getting a ton of THC, like maybe 10 or 20 milligrams of it. And there's none of it in here on the CBD front. You'd probably be getting, yeah, like it depends on the strain, but maybe somewhere around 20, it's, it's really hard to say, like you could be getting yeah, 20 milligrams to a hundred milligrams, something like that. So I'd say, you know, yeah, it, it's tough because like we're growing the plant specifically to have a certain cannabinoid profile that you wouldn't normally get in smoked flour. So like for some of the cannabinoids that are in here, you'd smoke 50 joints to get it, you know, or some joints that you'd smoke might not have any of it in there. Um, whereas others are present in really small quantities and might be like a tenth the amount or a hundredth of the amount that you would get from smoke flour. So I think it's kind of hard to do the equivalency between like that and a lemon because there's so many different strains and like the soil conditions, the amount of sun, the hour, like there's so many things that go into it, right? Um, when it's harvested that are going to change it. Um, like one of the things that we do is we only grow from cultivar. So there's no seed involved. It's all plant cuttings. So we have like exact consistency across yield from generation to generation because like we dialed in what we think is like the perfect profile. We want to maintain that without the genetic variation. Um, so we're using all like clones essentially. Um, so yeah, it's a tough one. So I'd say for some of the compounds, it's a lot more than what you would get through it. And for some of them, it's a lot less, which I know isn't the most helpful answer, but um, it works, right? Like it's an effective dose is what I would say. So you're hybridizing, you're specifically intentionally hybridizing the plants through camp plant cutting propagation. Uh, to be maximized based upon certain secondary chemical metabolites um, yeah. with the desired effect of the parasympathetic nervous system in override. So effectively to control the autonomic nervous system. Do you, yeah. do you talk, I know that you've had a lot of um, AMA educational outreach. Do you talk much about the cannabinoids in the brain and neurochemistry? You know, it's things that I wish we could talk about more like, there's this issue of education of the market generally. Um, and so like we do so much that like the average consumer just doesn't really care about, right? So, you know, we test for mold, mildew, residual solvents, heavy metals, pesticides, like all these things that 90% of companies don't actually do. Most consumers don't really care, right? Like most consumers don't care that we want to have additional CBG in it because CBG is what is essentially a transporter across the blood brain barrier of other metabolites, right? Like, like people just don't care. And it's not that interesting for them. And so it's something that like, I like nerding out about and our research scientists are really interested in, but the average consumer isn't. So when we talk about education, you know, we talk about what does it mean to be a responsible consumer and just letting them know like, Hey, a lot of these products have these heavy metals and they have these residual solvents. They have pesticides. Ours don't going a level deeper than that like we just don't get to do that much of it right um and like the research scientists at like their events and symposia like when they're talking about it with others who are really interested get to do that um but it's just not something that that we do a lot right now but i'll say this like the reason we're still producing content on those topics right now is 
two years from now when the market has caught up to us, people I think will be really interested in it, right? And as this becomes more widely acceptable in society and as doctors are being like prescribing these as medicines and things, like people will become more knowledgeable about it and we want to be ahead of that curve. So we're still doing some of it now, but it's not as much as what I would like. And that's part of just like, like the reality of having a consumer brand, right? Um, and our audience and who we sort of serve, I think is like more of a biohacker consciousness, wellness, meditation, like type crowd, which more than like the average show on the street does have an interest in these things. Um, we just have to find like, what's the appropriate level at which like people's eyes don't glaze over, you know? I love it. Um, so if we, if we take like square one, you've mentioned already some of the things like um, heavy metals. A lot of the CBD that we're coming out with today as a human population is sourced from China, is laced with heavy metals, has no regulation over it, and is priced right next to AMA or the next <laughs> higher quality CBD. And so um, there's lots of consumer guidelines to be aware of, which people can go to AMA. AmaHealing.co. AmaHealing.co. Love it. AMA. Amma. Amma in Tamil Amma. not only means mother, it depends on how you say it, but it also means yes, oh, <laughs> which I, I love. It's just like, yes, Amma. <laughs> so uh, beautiful. With that, um, let's dive into how you see this as a replacement. I mean, like, I kid you not, it's super well-timed, Ted, because just, I think it was yesterday, one of my students in a half, half Finnish, half Italian uh, girl living in Tuscany wrote and said, she was wanting beer and like clearly this isn't something that the institute for aliveness um condones in any way or another what i'll read you back and forth of of the text but um she said something like let's see it was on whatsapp i it's summertime and um a good beer that's really what i want i might associate with summer and, and socializing though do you have any tips or comments and i said back i mean you can try it and listen to your body because that's what we do at, at, at the institute for aliveness and she just yeah. finished shifting us the initiation and so seeing the effect on her body and i said i don't have tips on drinking beer i've never drunk it fermented wheat is just dumb and uh so then she said okay okay now i get it and like this inquiry is something that we very much push people down of, yeah. of why am I drinking this? Is it because it's social norm? Is it because there's a pressure? Is it because I'm troubled and riddled with social anxiety and lack of comfort in my own body and in my space? I have minimized presence and emotional intelligence, but I can't show up in the way that I want to show up. So to shortcut and short circuit there, I compromise my cellular integrity and levels of hydration, which are everything in my body by intaking this toxic substance, a la intoxication, intoxication, <laughs> like it's obvious, that I, you know, join the crowd and get crunked. And I, I mean, I've been making videos about this for years. So um, Ama seems to be, or Elevate as a product seems to be a little bit like a crutch, but a crutch that's very much needed for the crippled state of humanity's emotional intelligence. You can use that as a tool. I mean, you're so right. It's both, right? Like, there's the sort of like anthropological history and like the socialization, right, towards alcohol consumption side. And then there's also the other side, you know, which is as a numbing agent, right, of people who don't want to sit in their feelings. They don't want to deal with whatever is coming up for them. And it's a way to, to numb yourself and to dull it out, right? Um, and to not have to look at that. And I think that's one of the things that has been really interesting in the conversations that we're having with people in the sober movement is so many of them drank not because they liked how it felt, but because they didn't like how it felt to be themselves, right? Um, and they want to sort of numb that out. And if you don't like what you feel when you're just sitting with yourself, like that's where I think a lot of the sort of drug abuse comes from, right? So that's definitely part of it. But the other half of it, of this person who it doesn't sound like, you know, has a problem with alcohol, but just like likes the ritual of it is, like these rituals are powerful and they're important and there's something to them, right? Like the association of champagne for celebration, cold beer at the end of a hard day or a baseball game, glass of Chardonnay after I put the kids to bed, right? Like why is it that we have these rituals? And I think, you know, this is at least my personal thought is a lot of it is about sanctification of a moment and separation of like the profane of our normal day from like the divine and carving out sacred time, right? Like, 
you know, I come home from a hard day, I kick my shoes off, I crack a beer, I take a sip and I go, ah, oh. like, what is that, right? And I think it's putting away all the shit of the day and saying like, this is my time, right? Like I'm carving out this moment for myself, right? And that's a really important ritual. And that's something that I think we designed this product to respect is can we keep the ritual, but instead of giving yourself a poison, give yourself something that has a ton of affirmative health benefits and is going to get you more present and more connected and, and more able to, you know, just like have an enjoyable time with the people in your life and get rid of the anxiety and all those things. Right. So, you know, it's something I talk about a lot is like, I understand the ritual. I understand why people drink. I understand where this person is coming from. Right. And those are all things that I think are important, but I just want to shift us toward sanctifying the moment, having separation with just a different substance that approximates the feeling close enough that it like hits the spot and tickles us. Right. But actually shows us that there's something better out there. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, this is a lot of what we do with applied epigenetics at large at the Institute for Aliveness. If we're working with someone, and I mean, for decade, more than a decade, I've been taking people off coffee effectively for not yeah. dissimilar reasons. Uh, and in that, the ritual aspect is a huge part of it, especially if anyone has progressive Virgo in their chart, Mars, Venus rising, anything like that. Uh, because that ritual and the ritualistic nature to be able to just, you know, for example, with a hot beverage, it's that deep breath that you take. Yeah. The placebo effect of having alcohol is that you are going to be in a different cognitive state. And there is a chemical reaction that happens in the body when we take in anything, whether it is what I used to serve at my house in Bali, which was a fermented coconut water that I would make really super fizzy, oh. that coconut kefir along with, I used to put essential small doses of essential oils in it, whether it be lavender or lemon or cinnamon or a blend of grapefruit and other things. And like that beverage is going to have a chemical effect upon the cells that changes your state of being. Now, other things that can have state changes of state are a deep breath, right? Get the vagal nerve response in there where you're just so much more present. That habitual uh, return to mindfulness and through obviously bridging new neural networks in the brain and or strengthening ones to tap into relaxation. Through neuroplasticity, we learn that it becomes more normal to be elevated or to be calm or whatever the desired state is. And so I think that this is a beautiful crutch in the same way as when, when, I, when we're taking people off of coffee, for example, often the first step is a replacement. So for yeah. people who are trying to clear alcohol from, the, from their lives and do the real honest work, because at the end of the day, that's what it's about, is how honest are we with ourselves or are we lying to ourselves? Yeah. And, the, coffee is, um, the coffee is such a good example because I've had literally like on my phone the last couple of days, people message me. It's like, Hey, I've been trying to stop drinking coffee for years and they've been using this and stop. Like I have friends who have stopped vaping from using this. And the coffee one is super interesting because um, like the reason that you can't focus isn't that you're lacking energy that you're getting from coffee. It's that you have anxiety or your mind just isn't still enough to really focus on things. You have all these things bouncing around. And so what we're doing with the coffee is we're like cranking it up to like push through and drive through and bring a little bit of that focus but you can get focus and creativity from the calm centered grounded place as well. Um, and so that, that's a great example. And, and then also like, you know, there's a certain amount of altered state chasing that we do as humans because we inherently like to explore, you know, like the realm of our own consciousness and these things. And I think you're right. Like it's just about what are the ideal crutches for doing that, you know? Um, and what are ways that we can try and tap it into that, without having to bring in substance but i do think like you know the role of substance at least for me is is really it's a shortcut right it's a heuristic for quickly tapping into that state to be like oh right like this is what that pure state feels like okay i need to hold on to this like don't let this go right and what are other things that i can do to drop into this and then whether it's through my breath work or my meditation i catch a glimpse of it, it's like oh i'm doing it right like i'm feeling that thing right that i feel on substance and we start to pattern it like you were saying um, and, and just build those neural pathways in ways that make them easier and easier for us to access over time. Like I've been practicing TM transcendental meditation for, I don't know, like 15 years, I guess. And like, it's so much easier to drop into it now because I know like what the state is and what it feels like that you can sort of like get that hang time of that fleeting moment and like hold it and extend it. Right. Um, but you're totally right. Like, I think ideally I want this to be a tool for people like 
to replace alcohol, you know, I think is a good one, to replace coffee, to replace nicotine, whatever the things are that they're addicted to. But ideally, it becomes a pathway toward like nothing in clean living, right? Um, and, you know, maybe you finish half of it and give the rest of the ball to a friend because like, you just don't need it anymore. Um, I think, unfortunately, like a lot of us don't have the multi-year yoga meditation consciousness practice. And so you just need a little bit more help, right? Um, you, you know, we need more of those crutches, we need more of those tools and, and recognize them for what they are. And and you know, recognize that they are really helpful though for a lot of people, and and hopefully we can get them to a state where you know they don't need them quite as much anymore. And I can imagine the ongoing branding as well as the conversation that might happen on the back of a bottle would be towards this, because if that's the core intent of the company, which is what innovates towards product, uh, then that's clearly where it's going. So I'm going to check in. It's probably been a half hour since I've taken it. I've drunk the entire thing. Um, I mean, I'm normally in a hyper aware state of consciousness. Yeah. So I, I can't say I'm feeling too much different. I was very aware at the beginning of the plant potency. Like I felt the chemicals mm -hmm. uh, even before I took it in. Um, the, of course, without the, the recipes and just flat, like I do feel quite an aftertaste in the mid hind part of my tongue, which interestingly enough correlates to the digestive tract. Um, it should be based upon the that you supplied. It should be in my bloodstream, crossing the blood brain barrier of the secondary chemical metabolites are, are making their way um what what do you what would you say i should expect to be feeling about now i would say that you personally should expect to feel very little from it like the okay. people who are deeply <laughs> in balance and who have systems that are deeply in balance get much less benefit from it like i gave this to a friend who was an olympian and i was like hey use this with your workout and like he feels nothing right you give it to like former special forces operators who have PTSD and wow, like it does a lot for them. You give it to people who have had a lot of trauma that they haven't dealt with and wow, like it does a lot for them, right? You give it to people whose normal social ritual is drinking alcohol and it does a ton to them, right? But like, I would say the most enlightened folks in my lives are the ones who, who get the least from it. And it's almost like sort of a shibboleth. It's a test of like, are you as woke as you think, right? Like, do you, do you really like this? Do you need it, right? Or not? So I'd say like try it in a time where you find yourself getting a little bit out of balance and see if it brings you back um, into that state. Um, for me, like that's when, you know, I notice it the most myself and, you know, listen, like you're really fortunate to be in the like 0.00001% of people, right? Like most of our friends who still, you know, meditate and who still do yoga and who do all these things like do get a lot of affirmative benefits from it. Like you are sort of this unique unicorn case, right? Um, also like, dosage ranges you know are going to vary like really widely i mean the epigenetics of cannabinoid responses are really interesting one of our advisors david krantz who you should also definitely have on the show like that's what he researches is like your individual genetic response to cannabinoids you know the onset time is going to change how quickly you metabolize it how quickly it leaves your body is going to change um and so some people just like need more or less like i've given this to you know 300 pound linebackers who have half a dose and are like whoa and then you give it to like you know some 90 pound like wayfish woman who doesn't feel it with one has a double and then is like oh wow i really get this you know um like the base dose is intentionally a low one because it can be so powerful for people like i take a double whenever i take it right so you know what you had twice that would be my sort of like starting dose and i might have two of those in a night right so i'd say experiment it play with it like try a little bit more see as long as it's not making you feel like unwell you know like push it a little bit and see where some of those benefits start to come in for you um, but yeah, for, you know, 99% of people who we chat with, like what they notice most is a reduction in their social anxiety, for sure. A feeling of calmness, wellness, being really present with other people, feeling really connected to the folks that they're with. Um, and it's really designed as like a social beverage to be enjoyed, you know, sort of with other people. Um, so I think those are the most noticeable effects for, for most people. I love it. For some reason, I have an abnormal amount of friends who want to get into the drink industry. <laughs> um, and another one of my friends who I'd love for you to meet sometime, his name's Mark, he's in Amsterdam, and um, he had an idea to make, effectively, you could say it's a placebo effect drink yeah. um, that is more or less homeopathically programmed to be inducing the state that you want to have. 
Um, and so I could see a real, like a beautiful kinship with that kind of idea and this product based upon uh, the epigenetic eff efficacy on whomever's drinking it. And um, it's also like, it's not that like, you know, when, when we take people who have like these health problems, physical or mental, like there's a lot of effect that they have from it. And I love giving it to skeptics, right? Like a lot of these people who are in law enforcement and physicians who don't believe in plant medicine, like those are the people who I like to convert the most. So like, I'll drop in his placebo beverage. Like that sounds cool to me and interesting. Um, I, what I like taking from that is have, have any intention behind your consumption. Um, that's something that we've thought about putting on the bottle of like doing an intention setting when you consume it and trying to program how it's going to affect you. And that's something that I believe in. Like we can shape our experience, right? Through the intention that we set behind it and something that we have toyed with. And maybe that's something you can help us out with is like coming up with some interesting ones to put on there or have a little guide that we send to people with it. Um, but it, it is interesting and that's definitely like a real phenomenon that happens. Yeah. I would love that. And I mean, that's also kind of getting once, once people use the crutch, right. To get off the crutch, yeah. it's like, where does it go from there? And then being able to appreciate the medicine, but something that we see in at large in the plant kingdom. And I don't know who's a skeptic about plant medicine. That's kind of crazy because 70% of all cancer drugs are derived from plant compounds. So it's, it's like, the, what, it's wait, what? Right? Like, like the pharmaceuticalization of these compounds is a lot of the issue, right? Like we're not, when we're driving drugs from these things, we're isolating one single compound because that is literally what is required to get through drug development. You have to isolate the single compound, right? And this is my philosophy is isolates are so much less effective than whole plant extracts, right? Like when, okay, so metformin, I think is the second most prescribed drug in the country, right? And it's used for insulin resistance and, and some other things. Like people don't realize that it comes from lilac, right? It's like, you know, people found that like when goats were eating a lot of this French lilac, some of them were passing out because it was lowering their blood pressure by so much. Like we discovered it, we made this drug from it, but it's an isolate, right? Like the pill is so much less effective than making a tea from the actual plant. So by the time it gets to, you know, like the pill form, people do not think of it as a plant medicine. The doctors don't think of it as a plant medicine, right? When I ask them like, hey, you know, you could just give them this tea instead. It's the exact same thing. It's actually more effective and it doesn't have these crazy dosage curves and it doesn't have all these liver toxicity effects. They're like, oh, like I didn't know that, right? And so like, you're lucky to be in a space where people are aware of these things. But from having been just talking about this with the world at large, like, people have no idea that the vast majority of pharmaceuticals have some sort of derivation, you know, of, of a plant compound in them. Um, it just gets so dissociated from that, you know, by the time it makes it to your bottle that people literally have no idea that there are safer, healthier, natural alternatives, you know, out there. And I don't want to come off as someone that's like anti-drug and anti-Western medicine. Like there's a place for that, but if you can get the exact same thing in a more natural form with less negative side effects, like that's worth exploring at least. I want to draw a parallel to a lot of what we do because so so ethnobotany at large and especially herbal especially herbal ethnobotany, which is what you're referring to, is looking at the relationship between people and plants and how we co-evolved or where we discovered, for example, witnessing goats eating, you know, lilac plants or whatever it might be. Um, that the the side of it that is my personal expertise is food plants, and so um, one of my famous kind of viral videos is nutritional science is bullshit because it's the same kind of extraction of yeah. a mineral or vitamin given to you either in fortified almond milk or in your daily vitamin or in who knows a cannabinoid product whatever it is and there's an assumption that the body takes that in a knows what to do with it yeah. b that it has the same effect as it would in its original plant formula and see essentially what we're doing whether it is through extraction of food for gastronomy or whether it is in a vitamin kind of health oriented way is we're, we're disrupting the perfection of mother nature and not to be esoteric or, or hippie about that, but just like there's a lot more going on than we have any idea about. And yeah. so like massive props and respect for you guys, at least in the realm of one plant that has gained tremendous popularity for a multitude of reasons, cannabis. Of, of taking in the bigger spectrum minus the one that sometimes gets I mean, people that's just one example like we do a formula <laughs> uh, we do like a daytime formula for focus inflammation um with curcumin in it but 
we're not doing curcumin, we're doing a total curcumin related complex derived from turmeric root, right? Because again, curcumin is one compound, there's so many that are in there that have these beneficial effects. And when you don't derive it from the actual root, you're losing so much of the efficacy from it. So I think like this is one beautiful thing for people to take away is like, whether it's a vitamin, mineral, whatever, like consuming it from whole plant sources or whole food sources is so much more effective than taking it in a pill form. And people also don't realize that their pills, their daily multivitamins, like there are literally competing things in there. Like zinc inhibits the absorption of so many other vitamins and you're taking it in this one pill and you're literally like guaranteeing yourself that you're not going to absorb it and it's not going to work. So I think you're right. Like this is a beautiful framework to, to approach these things from. Um, also, I have like three minutes left, just a heads up. Beautiful. So um, I know that you wanted to speak a little bit about the history of alcohol and I don't know if you want to throw that in here in the end or if there's anything else that you want to say. I think it might be part two. <laughs> oh, it's part two. All right, we'll get to the history of alcohol part two to get more into Elevated. It um, is I'm really interesting, really, but yeah. I'm super. I mean, and I've actually, I was doing experiments that I didn't really share with my audience a few years ago. So that would be a beautiful part two. Cool. Um, is, is there anything else you want to share about now? I mean, definitely if people want to find out more about Alma, they know where to go. Yeah, um, really slash elevate. Um, we also put together a little discount code for your audience, which is a lot. Um, okay. so 10% off anything on the site. Um, just as a thank you for your crew. And, and yeah, listen, like I'll leave people with this. Like if you want to nerd out on this stuff further with me, like please reach out to me. I would love it. You know, we love digging into the science behind the stuff with people. We love talking about it. If you have questions about it as it relates to like your individual sobriety or whatever, you know, health issues you have going on, like, Let's jam on it, you know, love to talk about it. And I just say like, be a responsible consumer of these products, right? Know that most of what's out there isn't what it says it is. You have to dig into the COAs, you know, the certificate of analysis behind these products to be a responsible consumer. You have to make sure that they're testing, not just for potency, but for molds, mildews, pesticides, residual solvents, heavy metals, you know, all these other things. Um, and just try and use whole plant sources where you can and make sure that's extracted, you know, in ways that really honor the plant, right? Um, and that leave it in, in as close to the natural state as possible. I love it. And as always, we are honest with the, the intention of why we're taking it, of what we want from it, and the effect that it has on us, of that being really a litmus test of if we need. Because the plants, as teachers, as you said, are here to show us something. You know, Neem Karoli Baba can take a whole tube of acid and not have anything happen because there's an effect of that awareness, that consciousness is already inside. So this can be a tool on our pathway. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. I appreciate it. Yeah, virtual hugs are great until we can do uh, a real one. Yes.